J.J. Thompson was a British physicist who was very interested in cathode rays. He wanted to know what they were, what they were made of, and if they had a mass or a charge. In 1897, he did some really important research using cathode ray tubes. Through this research, he was able to conclude that cathode rays are composed of negatively charged particles. We know these particles as electrons. So J.J. Thompson can be credited with the discovery of the electron. A cathode ray tube is the forerunner of the television tube. It is a glass tube from which most of the air has been evacuated. When the two metal plates are connected to a high voltage source, the negatively charged plate, called the cathode, emits an invisible ray. The cathode ray is drawn to the positively charged plate, called the anode, where it passes through a hole and continues traveling to the other end of the tube. When the ray strikes the specially coated surface, the cathode ray produces a strong fluorescence or bright light. When an electric field is applied across the cathode ray tube, the cathode ray is attracted by the plate bearing positive charges. Therefore, a cathode ray must consist of negatively charged particles. We know these negatively charged particles as electrons. So I have here a Tesla coil, and I'm going to excite this metal here, and it's going to emit electrons, and then this, is, this plate is coated with a phosphorescent material, so the electrons are going to make it emit some green light, and then this thing is an anode, it's positively charged, so it's going to attract the electrons, and then we're going to see what happens if we use a magnet. Okay, so I'm going to use the Tesla coil. And you can see the light that's being emitted. So now let's look at what happens when we put the magnet on. Okay, here we go. You can see the ray being attracted towards the magnet. What it essentially is, it's a vacuum chamber. There are no gases inside this glass tube. Uh, the only thing we have are two electrodes, one's called the cathode, the other's called the anode, and a fluorescent screen um, in the background. It's coated with some type of fluorescent material. When I turn the power supply on, we'll see a beam that, is, that causes that fluorescent screen to glow. Looks like a nice straight line, doesn't it? We call that a cathode ray because it emanates or begins at the cathode and shoots across over to the anode. J.J. Thompson was working with cathode rays. We really didn't understand what they were. I mean, we have electricity going in one side and coming out the other, but there's nothing inside to conduct it. It's a vacuum tube. So he decided to apply a magnetic field um, to this cathode ray and he found something interesting. Let me apply one pole of the magnet to this beam and we'll see what it does and then we'll flip it around and see what the other pole does. This is my favorite part. Can you see what's happening to that beam? What does it appear as though it's happening to it? It's moving. It's moving. It's being repelled, isn't it, by the magnet. Let me flip the magnet around and what do you think is going to happen this time? Well, if it's being attracted on one pole, see how it's being attracted there? Let me rotate it so the kids on the, this side of the room can see it. See how it's being attracted there? And then the other pole, do you see how it's being pushed down? What does that tell me about that beam? It has a what? It has a charge. Let me tell you about the poles of the magnet. The one that pushes it away is the negative pole. So what does that tell you about the charge of those particles? Negative. Negatively charged particles. And J.J. Thompson was actually able 
uh, to do a charge uh, to mass ratio of these particles, and he found that these particles were about 2,000 times lighter than a hydrogen atom. Now, at the time, that was very profound. What did Dalton say? Are there any particles smaller than an atom? J.J. Mm -hmm. Thompson just found something 2,000 times smaller than a hydrogen atom. Why is the hydrogen atom and something 2,000 times smaller than it so profound? Hydrogen. Because hydrogen is the smallest atom, isn't it? So if we found something 2,000 times smaller, we have found our first subatomic particle. And it's called the electron. electron. Discovery. William Crookes discovered cathode rays when he was studying electrical discharge in gases. Whereas J.J. Thompson discovered that the cathode ray consists of negatively charged particles called electrons. Production. Cathode rays are produced in a discharge tube. Hence, the discharge tube is generally referred to as the cathode ray tube. The cathode ray tube is a partially evacuated glass tube with cathode and anode placed at the ends of the tube. A vacuum pump is used to partially evacuate the tube. The cathode is connected to the power source with the help of a clip. The tube is supported on a stand. It was found that electric discharge through gases took place only when the pressure inside the tube is lowered and the potential difference between the electrodes was high. To produce cathode rays, high potential difference of 10 kV to 20 kV is applied between the electrodes and the pressure is reduced to 0 0.0001 mm of mercury by means of a vacuum pump. A glow is seen on the walls of the glass tube. The bright fluorescence glow is due to the striking of the rays emitted by the cathode. These rays are cathode rays. Properties of cathode rays Cathode rays travel in straight lines. When an opaque object is placed in the path of the cathode rays, a shadow is cast on the glass wall opposite to the cathode. This shows that cathode rays travel in straight lines. Cathode rays consist of negatively charged particles. The rays deflect towards the positive plate when the tube is exposed to an electric field. This is because the negatively charged particles in the cathode rays get attracted towards the positive plate. Cathode rays are deflected by the magnetic field. When the tube is exposed to a magnetic field, the cathode rays follow a curved path, showing that they are deflected by the magnetic field. Cathode rays produce X-rays when they impinge on a metal with a high atomic weight. Cathode rays travel with a high speed almost equal to the speed of the light and hence possess kinetic energy. When cathode rays are made to fall on a paddle wheel, a wheel starts rotating showing that the rays possess kinetic energy. A cathode ray tube is the forerunner of the television tube. It is a glass tube from which most of the air has been evacuated. When the two metal plates are connected to a high voltage source, the negatively charged plate, called the cathode, emits an invisible ray. The cathode ray is drawn to the positively charged plate, called the anode, where it passes through a hole and continues traveling to the other end of the tube. When the ray strikes this specially coated surface, the cathode ray produces a strong fluorescence or bright light. When an electric field is applied across the cathode ray tube, the cathode ray is attracted by the plate-bearing positive charges. 
Therefore, a cathode ray must consist of negatively charged particles. We know these negatively charged particles as electrons. A moving charge body behaves like a tiny magnet and it can interact with an external magnetic field. The electrons are deflected by the magnetic field. As expected, when the direction of the external magnetic field is reversed, the beam of electrons is deflected in the opposite direction. In 1897, J.J. Thomson, an English physicist, determined the charge-to-mass ratio of an electron. He adjusted the electric field so that the electrostatic deflection, theta E, was the same as the magnetic deflection, theta B, and was able to calculate the charge-to-mass ratio of an electron using the following equation. Where E is the applied electric field, theta is the angle of deflection, B is the applied magnetic field, and L is the distance traveled by the cathode rays. Thomson determined the charge to mass ratio of an electron to be negative 1.76 times 10 to the 8th coulombs per gram. E. Goldstein constructed a special tube known as a canal ray tube. These tubes usually have two chambers which are separated by a perforated metallic disc severed as cathode of the discharge tube. The space between anode and cathode of the discharge tube contains a small number of residual gas molecules. The anode and cathode are supplied with high voltage. The electrons emitted from the cathode collide with the residual gas molecules. These collisions knock an electron out of each gaseous atom, generating positively charged ions, which are accelerated towards the cathode and they pass through the holes in the cathode, producing a beam of positively charged particles on the back of the cathode. As the positively charged particles pass through the holes or the canals in the cathode, they are called canal rays. W. Wien succeeded in deflecting the canal rays. He made one small circular hole in the cathode and introduced two plates behind the cathode. When a strong electric field is applied between the plates, the particles are attracted towards the negative electrode so that these are positively charged particles. Therefore, these are often called as positive rays.
So we're going to continue here with our discussion on the history of the nuclear model of the atom. Remember in the previous video we talked about how the electron was discovered by J.J. Thomson and the experiment with the cathode ray tube. In this video we're going to spend some time talking about how we discover the charge and mass of the electron and this was an experiment that's performed by Robert Millikan. So here's a brief summary of what Thomson did and what we talked about in the previous video but basically at the end of his experiment he discovered that the cathode ray is composed of negatively charged particles which was later called electrons. Now one thing that uh, I want to describe a little bit is that Thomson was able to determine something called the charge to mass ratio of the electron to be a certain value which is given here and this should be actually negative number here um, but the value is negative 1.76 times 10 to the 11th coulombs per kilogram. So let me just mention what this charge to mass ratio is. So you remember that in the cathode ray tube experiment what he was able to do was he was able to influence the direction of the cathode ray, in other words bend the cathode ray by uh, applying an appropriate magnetic or electric field outside and so the degree of bending he concluded because these are composed of particles he concluded that the degree of bending will depend on how heavy the particle is which is the mass of the particle and then because the particles are negatively charged and they interact with these uh, positive and negative electric field um, then the degree of bending will also depend on the charge of the particles so in other words both mass and charge will influence the degree of bending of the uh, particle of the electron. Unfortunately with the type of instrument that he was able to use at the time he wasn't able to determine what is the exact mass and charge of the electron itself but what he was able to do was he was able to use ex experiment to determine the mass the charge to mass ratio so in other words the the actual you know the key the charge divided by the mass was what he was able to determine and that's what this number represent negative 1.76 times 10 to the 11 coulombs per kilogram coulomb is a unit for charge now if you look at this number you notice that it's a pretty big number right 10 to the 11 is a big number so that implies something about the electron the electron must be a a, a particle that has a relatively small mass right because this is a charge to mass ratio, the mass is at the bottom, the denominator. The mass must be a really small mass, yet the charge is, you know, with respect to the mass, is a fairly large charge. Okay? So the question then from here on is what exactly is the charge and what exactly is the mass of an electron? Because if we really want to know how the electron works, we need to know those two properties individually we don't we can't just use the charge to mass ratio because that doesn't provide us with exactly what is the charge and what is the mass of the electron so now we're going to move on to Millikan's experiment which is often called the oil drop experiment and this was the experiment that um, ends up showing us allowing us to calculate what is the mass of the electron because he was able to do to use this experiment to determine the charge of an electron. So let me describe the setup of the experiment really quickly. The way Millikan uh, did this was the following. So he started with a setup that looks like this. So there's a chamber here. Inside the chamber there's two electric plates. One is positively charged, the other one is negatively charged. And he has a basically kind of a power source of some sort that allows him to control um, the voltage that's exerted by this uh, charge plates. Okay, so he can create, you know, he can basically control how much voltage difference there will be in between these two charge plates. So what he did was he had a, a canister here, or a can containing oil, and then the oil is being sprayed, and when it comes out of this spray, it becomes these small drops of oil. So this is very similar to if you're using something like a um, you know WD-40 or something when you're spraying it or when you're spraying um, anything you, you have a can and then you spray out the uh, substance comes out as drops so the drops as you'll see in this animation the drops once it's sprayed out from um, the uh, can would just drop down to the bottom because uh, of gravity okay so all the all droplets have a certain mass and they're just gonna fall down to the bottom because of gravity and in the first part of the experiment what he did was just he just wanted to know what is the mass of these uh, oil droplets so he used uh, 
kind of classical physics calculation using Newton's equation to determine what is the um, mass of each of these oil droplets okay and then the next part of the experiment is the following so you see that oil droplets just falling down to the bottom because of their masses right so at this point the only force acting so if you think about the force acting on these oil droplets is just gravitational force so the only thing that's happening to these oil droplets is being uh, you know going down to the bottom because of uh, attraction to gra uh, um, the center of the earth okay now when he, once he did that first experiment to figure out the mass of the oil droplets the second part of the experiment was then he had an x-ray source which is then shine onto the uh, this part of the chamber and this part of the chamber contains air so when uh, x-rays shine on the air uh, around the oil droplet what happens is then the electrons on air would be ionized in other words the uh, the I should say the air would be ionized and what that means is the electron is kicked out from air and because the electron can't just float around it jumps onto the uh, jumps onto the oil droplet that's falling down okay so let me just show you in terms of animation what happens there so he's shining this x-ray and you can see it through the microscope here it's gonna uh, what's happening to the oil droplet so when the um, you you can see here that it's marked as negative the reason is because the uh, air the electrons from air around this which is has been ionized by uh, the x-ray then jumps onto the oil droplet and there's variable number of electrons that are going to be on this oil droplet so you might have 10 electrons here you might have 20 you might have 100 so different numbers of electrons are on each oil droplet okay now what's interesting of course now is that you notice what happens here he starts to turn on this uh, voltage which remember controls the strength of these uh, electric field that's exerted by these two plates right here this positive and negative plates right here and you notice what happens as he does this to the oil droplet so watch what happens there okay so you notice what's interesting is that first off the oil droplets slow down and then at some point the oil droplets start to move up right and so what's happening there well remember what he did here was he turned on that uh, electric field so this plate is here is negatively charged this plate is positively charged so because these oil droplets are negatively charged because they have electrons on them they're going to be repelled by the negative plate and attracted by the positive plate so at some point they start to move up uh, and they're only going to but remember they have to fight gravity right so gravity is pulling them down but this electric force is pushing them up so there is a point if you control this voltage appropriately there's a point when what when the droplet is exactly suspended right in the middle because that's when the gravitational force which is pulling this thing down and the electric force which is pushing it up is exactly balanced with each, with each other and that's actually an important condition when you have that condition you can then determine how much charge is uh, on each of these droplet or in the droplet that's suspended okay let me show you how this happens so the first thing to realize is what is the force due to gravity well it's just given by this equation m times g in this particular class because we're talking about chemistry you don't really need to know this at this point this is a physics uh, equation I'm not expecting you to be able to make any calculation with it but you do need to know that uh, you know the gravitational force in this case is given by m times g m stands for the mass of the oil droplet g is just the acceleration due to gravity which on earth has a, a constant value okay now remember that when the oil droplet uh, when the he turns on that um, electric uh, field you have this addition this other force that counteracts the gravity force which is the electric force and the electric force is given by this equation Q times E where Q is the charge of the oil droplet and E is the size of the electric field that's given by those two plates right there okay when the remember that when the uh, oil droplet is exactly suspended in the middle the two forces are equal to each other so Q times E is equal to M times G now remember what he wants to determine here is the value of Q which is the charge uh, 
on the droplet. So if he knows all these three, which he does, he knows this because that's a constant. He knows the mass of the oil droplet. He could measure that. He knows the E because E is what he controls using that box earlier that I was showing. He controls it using this. So as a result, he knows all these three components. So he can use that to calculate Q. And Q, of course, is the charge of all the electrons on the oil droplet. Now, when he did this for a bunch of different oil droplets, he found that the Q that he got from making all those calculations is always a multiple of this number right here, which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulomb. Okay, so in other words, he might get something that's 10 times this number, something that's 20 times this number, or something that something that 100 times this number. So what that tells him, that point is that this value must be equal to the charge of one single electron because we can have, remember, a lot, you know, different number of electrons on the oil droplet. We can have 10, we can have 20, we can have 100. But if all those numbers are always a multiple of this number, this must be the charge of just one electron because everything else is, you know, 10 times one electron, 20 times one electron, and so on. Okay? Now, once he was able to determine that this is the charge of one single electron, he then can go back to the charge to mass ratio that Thomson figured out from his cathode ray experiment. This is the charge to mass ratio and then this is the uh, charge uh, value and using dimensional analysis you should be able to figure out the mass of an electron. Okay? In fact I'm going to leave that as your um, homework. Okay, so figure out the, the mass of a single electron using the charge to mass ratio and then the charge that Milton figured out. All right.